Fragments of Silicon, this week bringing you hopefully more treats than tricks. then welcome to a special uh post halloween episode of fragments of silicon uh done so because um well halloween had some scheduled conflicts um anyway i'm your host adam uh joining me as always is the regular crew and uh let's get to the news uh let's see gallets why didn't you start us off this week this week has been long and weird uh (laughs) the weather's been pretty crummy mostly uh, at work, they like relocated my office on very short notice, so I spent the entire week trying to get stuff done, but also like make sure I didn't lose anything and that everything got where like it's just now mostly set up, and we still are waiting to get a new dividing wall, so I have an actual wall on one side of me. <laughs> that um. So that's been uh, weird. Um, Video game wise, uh, I forget if it was since last time we talked about uh, we we had a show, but uh, I messed up playing Digimon Links the uh, while back, and uh, instead of getting the stuff I need to make two of my favorite Digimon, I actually traded in for a whole bunch of things to make water attacks stronger. So still kicking myself a little bit over that, but. uh, haven't stopped playing um and and a more seasonally appropriate note although the reason wasn't actually necessary seasonal i uh was talking to some people in the time spinner discord about metroidvanias and the castlevania series and i remembered that i we were talking about the gba and ds ones and i remember that i never actually finished circle of the moon so i've started another attempt to do that Mm -hmm. Uh, it's still it's not bad it's just uh Way uh, more cer- primitive than even the one, even the next one. Yeah. Well, certainly and... also uh, relied on um, luck. Way too. Yeah. Much. I'm mm-hmm. playing it with like two or three different maps and an enemy list mm-hmm. to make sure I don't miss any cards because those are like the main mechanic of the game, and whether or not you get them is based on random drops. But yeah, even even Harmony of Distance didn't have much, but at least had a shop. And there was in this game, literally, even if you're full on hearts, it just drops more hearts from candles because there's no score. <laughs> right. Um, even in Harmony of Distance, there's a sh- there's a shop that even if they only buy like gems, but they sell like potions and meat and stuff in this. Uh, your recovery is limited to save points and uh, random drops from enemies. Oh, man, wall chicken. (laughs) Not even wall chicken, although there are a whole ton of not really marked uh, invisible wall rooms. (laughs) So, yeah, that's that's about where I am. Okay. Um, Oh, yeah. yeah. Oh, yeah, and we uh, got the part back so our washing machine is working again. Uh, or at least sort of, because apparently there was another problem too. So it's not actually working better. It just isn't not working at all because the parts like back in. This is something something functional. Is there something wrong with like the master board or something which mm. isn't being manufactured anymore? Mm. So if we wanted to get that fixed, we'd have to send that off for like a week to be fixed. So mom and dad are saying they might not want to bother with that. It might just get a new washing machine. That would probably be the best bet. That, that yeah, that, I was thinking that might not be a bad idea. Uh, right, anything else? Still, it's no. It's, it's ni- nice to have clean clothes again. <laughs> uh, no doubt, no doubt. Um, okay, uh, Petty, you're up. Uh, well, Monday I had that appointment to see the neurologist about um getting SSI, so. Now it's just the waiting game. 
Fun times. Yeah, I don't know how long the judge has. Can't remember if it's six weeks or 90 days. I'm sure I... you'll find out. Yep. <laughs> um, also, in gaming-related stuff, I kind of messed up when I was playing through the original the Kingdom Hearts 1 and I forgot to save and my game crashed so 10 hours of grinding were lost so I said screw it and just beat the game when grinding save often <laughs> yeah yeah I thought I was but <laughs> Kingdom Hearts has a weird thing when it's saving where it doesn't make it easily known that you've saved because it takes so long to access the um, saved game, it it's hard to re remember if you've saved or not, especially at like two in the morning. Oh boy! And now I'm almost done with Kingdom Hearts two. I I got Ultima weapon and stuff, so it's literally I can go try and fight the data versions of the basically the super bosses of the game. Or I can just go beat it. So that's that's something I need to figure out what I want to do with. And Kingdom or not Kingdom <laughs> Final Fantasy fourteen stuff has been going all right. We basically lost a week though because of weird scheduling kerfuffle with some of the raid members, but such is life on an online game. Mm-hmm. And outside of that, not a whole lot's been happening. <laughs> outside of that, yeah. Uh, what about your uh, knee surgery? Uh, we don't. I see the doctor on Monday about what we're doing with that. Right. Um, just so you know, we we now have December uh, people booked. So. All right. Yeah. Well, I, I noted that that was going to be a thing. Yeah. Anyway. It's um, Twilight Europe. Alright. <clears throat> well, um, matters that I was um, alluding to last week I've been taken care of and smoothed out for now. So that's good. Not much to worry about at the moment. Um, that's now, um, it's. We, um, uh, had trick or treat on Tuesday night, um, to avoid the. Any potential rain Wednesday, though that rain didn't come until late um, Thursday morning, <laughs> and um, we only had 13 trick or treaters, and which is to be expected because there ain't too many um, kids where I live anymore. So most of the young people have moved out, which I don't blame them. Um. Today, the um, holiday rush has kicked in at work, so... Rest in peace. I'll survive. I've been through it for five years so far. <laughs> no. um, <laughs> so good luck uh, feeling with the Christmas music. <laughs> I actually enjoy Christmas music, so... <laughs> it isn't gonna yeah, it never, it never really bothers me either. Hmm. Yeah, I prefer it over some of the country music they play over there. Yeah. Anyway, um... Well, there's always the combination of the two. Aggressively, mm. Grandma got run over by a reindeers. <laughs> Fair enough. <laughs> um, anyway, um, in terms of gaming, um... I've been playing the game I'm going to be reviewing this Sunday. I've done good ways through it so far. Yeah, your first review. Uh, indeed. I'm excited for it, actually. <laughs> Yay. <laughs> well, I mean, um, well, we've hmm? got multiple people on staff. So. Indeed. So. And um, I bought the um, Alone in the Dark anthology during the Hall Halloween sale, and I played some of the first one, and I played some of the 2008 one. I've got things to say about 2008 one <laughs> later. <laughs> we'll get to that when we get to that. Like, yeah, so that'll be it for me. <laughs> uh, I guess it's my go. Oh, yep. let's see. Uh, this week I have been fighting a head cold. 
Yay, I'm head not, colds. Yeah. I'm not sure if it came through on any of the other broadcasts we've done this week, but, um, you know, this week I got sick. Um, hmm. I didn't notice anything. Um, like, hmm. uh, well, I guess, uh, you know, thank the medicine. You know, I've been <laughs> taking a lot of uh, NyQuil, DayQuil, Halls. Um, hmm. I'm like... My throat was swollen uh, earlier this week. Now it's just moved to, to my head, so, you know, producing a lot of mucus. You know. uh. Yeah. It, colds are not fun. No, colds no, they are not. not. Yeah. It's like, it's something I'll get over, you know. It's just a cold. It's just, yeah, yeah not fun. Also, fucking cough syrup is expensive. Yeah, it is. You know, fucking $10 for... A uh, bottle of NyQuil these days, or DayQuil. Uh, yeah. Uh, like, no, um, yeah. Uh, let's see. Uh, had to revamp our November review schedule quite a bit because um, it's one of those no codes, no codes. All of the codes got dropped on us this week. <laughs> um, like next week, we got four reviews to do because um, you know we don't have a Sunday slot for the Thanksgiving week for example so no i think we got reviews out until december at this point you know and some of them are long games like uh i got a code for call uh call of cthulhu the official game that's gonna take it that's something i'm doing during the you know thanksgiving break you know hmm. fun times but you know we, we have multiple people we can you know handle like four reviews you know it's like not everyone is working on all four reviews so mm -hmm. <laughs> anyway um outside of that that's about it for the news this week um so merrily we shall roll along to the interview portion and this week we are welcoming a good friend of mine matt barton of matt chat hello 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 Hello. Nice banter. <laughs> you know, have you guys ever heard the 8-Bit Christmas album? Uh, not offhand. That's pretty good. If, you, mm. if you're stuck with Christmas music, that's... Uh, sounds like it was made on a, a Nintendo, maybe. It's on YouTube. You just look for 8-Bit Christmas. I'll keep that in mind in December. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I think I probably owe somebody a fine for mentioning it in November. Well, it's like... You know, come, come the minute after Thanksgiving, it's going to be nonstop Christmas music on some stations. <laughs> if you work in retail, yes, it's, it's some places are nonstop to, Christmas music now. It's yeah. time to dust off the Bing Crosby. Yeah. Right. Dean Martin. When do you ever hear those guys other than Christmas? Indeed. I'm like, <laughs> my understanding is that actually in other countries, they have a lot more new Christmas music made from year to year, whereas in the U.S., because Christmas is such a nostalgia holiday, yeah. we mostly just mm. rerun the classics with a few new things. Yeah, I hear that Beatles one. I'm like, wow, it's revolutionary. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, George, who's that, Warren or George Michael, somebody that's got the kind of snazzy little Christmas ditty? Uh, don't remember uh, offhand. Yeah, you'd know it if you heard it. <laughs> Probably. It's just, I, you know, I'm not rushing to listen to Christmas music. <laughs> you know, it's like, I'll get pumped enough of that um, during the holiday season. So, anyway. It's time for Thanksgiving music, you know. We don't get enough of that. Like, hmm. I can't. I can't think of any. That might be why. Yeah, like, <laughs> I, I think. I think the Puritans didn't believe in music except for like hymns. God bless the turkey. <laughs> uh, <laughs> yeah, this is going to be a fun interview. Yeah. All right. So cranberry sauce. <laughs> oh no, I could work with that. Uh, sure, why not? I mean. Go for some turkey right now. Me too. Anyway, so getting back on track here. Um, let's see, where to start? Where to start? Um, I suppose I should start with our usual question since it kind of relates to 
um, what we're going to be talking about overall, and that is, how did you get interested in video games? Oh, wow, well, yeah, I, I guess it was just kind of a generational thing, you know, my kind of like dads and sons get, get together over sports, ordinarily, I suppose, but my dad was a real nerd into computers and video games, and he'd take me along to the arcades with him, and remember, we used to play a lot of uh, Sinister, so he'd pick me up and put me, sort of position me in such a way where I could put my feet out against the uh, the cabinet, and I'd sort of be up around chest level, so he'd fly the ship, and my job was to hit the fire button <laughs> as quickly and as frequently as I could. Uh, so that's my earliest memory, and I'm pretty sure we had a Pong machine and uh, Vic-20 eventually. So it just was kind of part of my childhood, and I never grew out of it. Hmm. And, <laughs> um, well, it's like, well, I suppose I'm sp specifically targeting Pools of Radiance here. Oh, yeah. The game that started as a toilet. Well, <laughs> I don't know if you heard that story. Apparently, uh, it was Susan Manley was doing the art for that game, and uh -huh. uh, she they told her, you know, the game was Pool of Radiance, so they wanted to have the, the Pool of Radiance featured prominently on the artwork uh, for the game, right? So she went to, I think she was pretty new at the industry at that time. Uh, so she was drawing, she's a good artist and everything, but <laughs> she showed, when she showed her ideas to the team, they... You know, they said, that's that's really good, but it looks a little too much like a commode. Don't think that's quite the pool <laughs> that we want for our game. So uh, she had to go back to the drawing board with that. But uh, I would have loved to see that. I think that would be a pretty good reward, right? You get all the way through the game, and then you finally see the, uh, the commode of Radiance. <laughs> you know, that could work. I think that's a better ending than some of the Bioware games we've seen recently. Potentially, like, but that would have made, yeah, Pools of Radiance, uh, <laughs> Pool of Radiance, a, di a much different game. Like, yeah. yeah, that was one of the first role-playing games. I had Bard's Tale before that and Sword of Fargo. Yeah. Uh, so those were probably, I, I'm pretty sure there were some other ones. I just don't remember what. I was just too young to even remember much of it. Seems like I sort of have flashbacks of uh, Telengard, maybe. Hmm. Yeah, it's like I do remember the Gold Box series being a prominent part of my childhood as well. Although, I we had DOS in our house, so. Ah, uh, you Philistine! Hey, I got to ex experience the entire series. Ah, uh, you're gonna rub it in, are you? <laughs> I'm like, you're it's not it. my fault. Pools of Darkness never released on the <laughs> C64. I don't even count Pools of Darkness. No, that was that was a great tradition. You know, every it seemed like every birthday or Christmas, you know, to mention Christmas like yet again, uh, there seemed like there was always one of these new gold box games out. Mm -hmm. You know, by the time you get the game, and you pretty much want to get the clue book with it, right? Mm -hmm. And sometimes there was even a novel, like a novelization that went with it too. So you could uh, you could easily rack up, you know, seven sixty seventy dollars uh, yeah. worth of gold box goodness. Yeah, and. Uh, there was not just the Forgotten Realm stuff, but there was like the Dragonlance games. Oh, yeah, Dragonlance, the Buck Rogers, the Fr yeah. Savage Frontier stuff, the the Silver Box games. Yeah, Silver Box games, Eye of the Beholder. Yeah, uh, the, a lot of these. Uh... Pink. <laughs> I wish they would have just kept on making these these games. I'd still buy them happily. No, no doubt. It, you know, it's like I mean, uh, SSI did pretty much churned them out into like the mid 90s so they had a pretty long run to be honest yeah they switched over to stormfront studios for some of the later ones i'm pretty sure they did the frontier series yeah and then they got into those sort of alqua dim and the menzo barans and stuff dark sun mm -hmm. spell jammer <laughs> nothing ever seemed to click like the uh, gold box days yeah well Second edition AD and D is really, really weird and fragmented. Uh huh. <laughs> I'm like, <laughs> I mean, it's not. It's certainly playable. It's just, you know. Yeah. It, it, it's, play, it, it's playable somewhat in that, 
like how do I put this? Second edition AD and D is it's extremely um, exploitable. Yeah. Well, it's also the reason why it almost collapsed was it was less a congruent world than a whole bunch than a whole bunch of um, different rule sets kind of stapled together. Now, it's like you know what you were doing in say um, Dark Sun, and what you were doing in Ravenloft you may oh, not Ravenloft. it may not exactly be um, compatible. Granted, that was always kind of a problem. Um, what, dating back to like eight D and D edition one, but you know, with second edition being what it was, you know, and all the different different worlds. You, know, you got to give those uh, SSI folks credit. I mean, if you've played the some of the other D and D games made by other companies, like right. a Heroes of the Lance, I think is that is that the one for the Nintendo? Uh. Yeah, that yeah, that, that's that, 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 that also had a PC version, which also was not too good. Uh, was it the same people? U.S. Gold. I, I I don't know offhand, but you know it was better than the NES version. Say that. No. Playing Scape Torment NES version. Yeah, that I would like to see. <laughs> I. Don't think that would be feasible, like, or practical, or sane. I think you could play as Mort. Perhaps, like. Anyway. Well, <laughs> eh. All right. So basically, what this did was instill upon you a love of CRPGs, which is kind of handy for later. Anyway, so moving forward, I suppose we should talk a bit about the Matt Chat program uh, in brief. Uh, you know, for the uninitiated, what is this? What is Matt Chat? <laughs> That's a question I've been asking myself. I think I've been doing this uh, this YouTube show now. I think it's has it been ten years already? It quite possibly. Could I be. don't even remember this. Yeah, but it's. I did a book called Dungeons and Desktops, mm -hmm. and I wanted to do some videos to kind of promote that book. And it just kind of uh, blew up from there. I kind of got into making the videos. I started interviewing people on the show and uh, built up an audience with that. And it's been a lot of fun. Talked to a lot of <laughs> great people. I mean, stuff I never would have dreamed of being able to do. Uh, I mean, it's just so weird when you're a kid playing these games, you never imagine that you're going to actually be... Uh, in a one-on-one -on -one conversation with some of the people that made the game, right? We know that feeling all too well, actually. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Considering some of the people we've had on this program, you know, it's not, you don't, you kind of want to do the whole Wayne's World, though. We're not worthy thing, right? <laughs> Indeed, but you got to restrain yourself. You know, got to maintain a professional facade. Emphasis on facade here. <laughs> Now, gotta pre at least you know uh, pay lip service to the idea that you're professional. But um, what I want to really zero in, in is on the desktop, uh, the Dungeons and Desktops book. Um, what was the impetus for um, writing the original version of this? Well, that's another one of these things that was just pretty much random. I uh, had a. I don't know if you. I don't know if you knew me back in my armchair arcade days. That ring any bells? Uh, I maybe. <laughs> like, uh, basically, I guess this was even further back, probably fifteen, maybe even twenty years ago. I was with a group of guys doing this um, internet magazine, retro gaming magazine, online thing, and you know we were always just coming up with uh, ideas for features, and I thought it'd be pretty cool to do one on the history of. Um, computer role-playing games. I wanted to break it up, maybe do a three-part series, drag it, all, drag it out over three uh, issues. Uh, but that just exploded. You know, I did the first one of these, and you know, it was on Slashdot, it was on Gama Sutra, it was on Boeing. I think even uh, Will Wheaton was talking about it on his uh, whatever he had back then. And so I'm like, man, I, I sort of got a tiger by the tail here. Uh, so I contacted... Uh, Gama Sutra and said, let me just do the rest of the run on your your magazine. Maybe actually actually get paid uh, to do it. 
and then uh, from there, I guess there was a publisher, a book publisher, A.K. Peters, that was in, in cahoots with the Kama Sutra guys and Game Set Watch. And uh, they said, hey, do you know anything? Do you have anybody that would be interested in writing a book? Yeah, how about this Barton guy? You know, he's, he's doing this uh, three-part series. It's almost a book already. Why don't you work with him? Uh, so that's basically it. You know, we got in touch with the publisher. We did the book. Uh, it did pretty well. But it's been, you know, 10 years now, so they, it's been a little bit of change uh, over the last 10 years as far as video games are concerned, wouldn't you say? <laughs> yes, I would say that. Uh, so we started talking about uh, maybe doing, uh, you know, some ideas for new projects, and I kind of bounced the idea of doing a second edition of this book. Mm-hmm. Uh, so, if, you know, they're pretty excited about it. I mean, it's, there's, this is going to be a, re- a pretty big deal because some of the problems in the first edition were the the screenshots it's got these i don't know if you've seen the book first edition uh not offhand no okay well just imagine a really wonderful book <laughs> but, but the uh a lot of little screenshots and these these screenshots are grayscale mm. small and sort of hard to see i mean a lot of these things are about oh maybe two by two inches can't really make it out very well. Uh, so those are all going away. This this new edition is going to be just like our vintage game series and all these other books. It'll be nice, big, full color, uh, glossy pages, really beautiful images. Uh, that's something that's really going to make a difference there, I think. But otherwise, I've just pretty much reordered everything, reorganized it, uh, put in a bunch of uh, quotes from interviews I've done. I've uh, updated updated a couple of chapters with the Kickstarter games and pretty much all the major RPGs. And I think that's probably about, that's probably the main differences in this version. Like, and hopefully this will be the book. I'm, I'm, I'm kind of thinking of it as the book I really wanted to do the first time, but even better, th- even better than that. Uh, so I set that as my goal. And then our old uh, mutual friend Shane Stacks chipped in as well. He's got a, he got Chris Avalon to do the uh, forward for it, hmm. and we've got Brian Fargo and Richard Garriott in here. Mm-hmm. Um, several other people I can't think of right off the top of my head, but it's, it's going to be pretty cool. I'm really excited about it. Sounds like it. Like, um, let's see. So, well, what would you say you uh, kept the most between the two editions? Like, um, or rather, what would you say you had to change the least in terms of um, what you put out 10 years ago and now? That's a good question. I guess probably the, I tried to keep it as comprehensive as before, so I didn't want to take out games. You know, if anything, I wanted to put more games in. Uh, so I did change it up a little bit so that instead of one of the complaints before was that the uh, it was just game after game after game after game and sometimes the you'd kind of lose the narrative flow trying to put so many games into each chapter uh, so what I did I took the game if a game didn't really have an impact on other games it was just kind of a, a big deal at the time but it was basically unique uh, I moved that to the I call it the bestiary uh, the appendix the appendix basically at the end uh, so I, it's basically got all the same games that were in there before, but a lot of it's been moved into that appendix to make it a little bit better of a story. Uh, so sure. I guess that's about the same. You're not, I mean, don't get the new edition thinking this, it's going to be less comprehensive or less coverage. Mm-hmm. It's just, it's just, that should be about the same, uh, but with the addition, of course, of the newer stuff. Right. It makes sense. Like. We tried to keep it just as nerdy as before, too, with all the really cringeworthy puns and jokes. Mm. Well, I suppose before we go further along this uh, delineation, we should talk about what Dungeons and Desktop actually is. Uh, You know, exactly what does this book chronicle? Well, it's the history of the computer role-playing game. And so we start in here with... Basically, I call it the Dark Ages. So the weird stuff guys were doing back on the Play-Doh and the mainframes, 
even before games like Rogue were popular. Uh, right. So we kind of start there and then go all the way through, of course, the uh, old early Ultimas and the Wizardries. And, of course, you mentioned the Pool of Radiance series, and Dungeon Dungeon Master, Baldur's Gate, Icewind Dale, all those. Uh, uh, the Elder Scrolls series. Jeez, what am I leaving out here? Uh, <laughs> you know, just all oh, the Witcher. I mean, it, it's all in here. Uh, we do have a little bit of coverage in here of the... I got two chapters about Japanese role-playing games. Uh, you know, the book's not focusing on that, but I did want to talk about the ones that were big enough to... If I felt like they uh, they influenced the CRPG, I'll put them in here. Uh, so there's some talk of... Of course, I cover the Final Fantasies and the, uh, some Dragon. of the Zelda series and the Fantasy Star. Dragon Quest? Uh, yeah, Dragon Quest, of course. That's a big one. Uh, did you get the Black Onyx? Uh, Black Onyx. <laughs> I have to look for that one. I don't know. Yeah. That's kind of like the secret um, important building block to JRPGs. Like, it's the thing that flowed off from Wizardry and into Dragon Quest. Like, um, developed by Bulletproof Software. Uh, you might have to send me a link to that. <laughs> I mean, JRPGs aren't my specialty. I tried to. I felt like I had to say something about them in here. I, I, I know. I, uh, I know. It's just, yeah, that I could. It's not too late. You know, go ahead and send me that, and I'll put it in. <laughs> All right. Uh, I could send you a Wikipedia link, at the least. Um, anyway, uh, yes. And um, so, what uh, what games are you covering in the new edition? Well, pretty much everything that we had in there before, uh, we bring catch it up with The Witcher. Uh, the uh, I don't think Oblivion. Oh yeah, Oblivion wasn't out when I wrote the first one, so we talk about that one. Skyrim. Uh, we do the Mass Effect series, the uh, Dragon Age. Kind of hard to believe Dragon Age wasn't out at that time. Uh, so there's several of those. I talk about Kingdom Come Deliverance, uh, and then we jump into the Kickstarter games, and that's. You know, all the pillars of eternity, the uh, the uh, wasteland two, uh, Bard's Tale four. Oh, there's the link, <laughs> the Black Onyx. Uh, uh, I think we even were able to put Pathfinder in there, which just came out, right? Pathfinder Kings. Yeah, Kingmaker Shane covered that one. Yeah, we talked to Chris Avalon about that about a year ago. Serpent in the Staglands is in there. The Age of Decadence. Yeah. yeah there, there's all sorts of uh, uh, CRPGs from the Kickstarter set. Yeah, we're actually calling that chapter the, the Renaissance. <laughs> so I added that. I, I added a new era. <laughs> the Renaissance era. Because yeah, I really feel like Kickstarter and Fig and all these crowdfunding sources. I mean, it's, it's really amazing all these old school developers coming out of the woodwork and you know, getting their games funded. And they haven't all been successful, but I just think it's really, really cool that they're able to make games that were just inconceivable, you know, 10 years ago. Right. Though, I suppose on the flip side of that, I wonder if the Renaissance age isn't starting to come to a close. Like, um, you know, for example, Obsidian. Like, uh, their past few games haven't exactly um, done good business, from what I understand. You know, like, um, Tyranny flopped. Um, Pillars of Eternity 2 didn't do so hot. Yeah, it's like the rumor. How did that one do? I don't, I mean, I really liked the, I might even say a lot, maybe somewhere between really liked and loved uh, Pillars 2. <laughs> Actually, had a lot more fun with that than the first one, but. Yeah, I heard that too. It wasn't really all that financially successful. Yeah. I mean, the rumor is, is uh, Obsidian is going to get bought out by Microsoft. <laughs> yeah. Oh, sad. Well, that's so. what Microsoft is doing these days. Well, it's probably so. better to be bought out by them than Electronic Arts. But... I'm like, uh, I mean, still not great, but yeah, that's just that's like saying. It's better yeah. to ride a roller coaster than ride a roller coaster that just goes right into a brick wall. <laughs> the ogre's choice. No doubt. I mean, or, um, geez, 
kind of thing here. Um, well, Shroud of the parts... Avatar kind of got on people's nerves, and I think people yeah. are still kind of bummed about Star Citizen. And even Birds Tell 4. I mean, a lot of people, I've been reading some reviews of that and some pretty big presses, and man, people are really just hating on that game. I, I've heard. It's also the Bard's Tale 4 seemed to just kind of come out. Like, you know, it was like, oh, hey, it's suddenly releasing in mid-September. Like, so, I, I, you know. I hope that's not a sign of uh, financial straits. Who knows? I mean, I'm guessing that they are secure enough to released Wasteland 3. No. Uh, although, I, I don't know what Brian Fargo is doing. Yeah, yeah I heard he was retiring, and then he's not yeah. going to retire, and then he is going to retire. And... Well, it's more his uh, claim that if Wasteland 3 is successful, he'll rebuy Interplay. Uh, I don't know if you heard that. Yeah, I heard that, but he was yeah. saying, so they got a Kickstarter out for Wasteland 3 already? Uh, I'm like... Yeah, don't tell me I missed that. I don't... I Didn't that already happen? I honestly don't know. Like... It's just what I heard about the sales success of Wasteland 3. Live research. <laughs> yeah, Waste, Wasteland 3 in development. Yeah. Campaign successful. Wow. Oh, yeah, that was back in 2016. <laughs> what are we talking about here? CRPGs. Man, you see, it, you, you get your head buried so deeply in a book like this, and man, just you lose all cognizance of the of the real world. Yeah, no doubt. Well, how long have you been working on the revamped version of Dungeons & Dragons? <sighs> yeah, this thing. You know, in a perfect world where man had some discipline... I would have had this thing done in the summertime when I had pretty much full time to work on it. But no. <laughs> oh, but no, no, no. Had to wait until the semester started. <laughs> so this thing has just kicked my ass. Why? Uh, I mean, I think, <laughs> well, you know, it's, it's really tough to teach all day and grade papers and then want to sit down and work on a book, right? Yeah. yeah. So I don't know. It's 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 probably been about a year and a half in development, maybe. Of course, there's still some work left to do on it. Have to proofread it and hopefully add a <laughs> add a little bit about the black onyx. Thank you for that extra work, Adam. <laughs> Not a problem. I'm just totally kidding. <laughs> yeah. That'd be great when it comes out. I mean, no doubt. Well, I mean, uh, do you have like a Date? Not yet. Something, something before the heat death of the universe. <laughs> this publisher is actually pretty good. I don't, it probably won't be out before Christmas, but I imagine that they have these quarters. I think so. I'm, I'm guessing they'll probably put it out in their next quarter, uh, which, just on a wild guess, I'd probably say maybe March or April. Hmm. Kind of hard to say with these. Hopefully you and uh, old Mr. Shane Stanks will be able to help me market this thing. <laughs> you know, these well, publishers are not the... Uh, they don't exactly put out the billboards on the, on the subway. We do what we can. I mean, that's why we're, we have you <laughs> on the show, you know, now. <laughs> yeah, I appreciate it. Thank you, guys. No problem. No problem. Yeah. I have to make sure you get a complimentary copy. <laughs> yes. Did you see that Arcana book by the Whitwers? John Peterson and Mike Whitwer? Mm, no, I haven't. And that thing. If you like D&D, you got to get a copy of that. Oh, yeah. I think I, I've seen the cover, but Holy I have cow. Yeah. Uh, I know what you're talking about. That did look impressive, but it's one of those. I just haven't had time. Yeah. I don't even know how much they're charging for copies of that thing. I mean, this thing is uh, bound in human flesh and inked in human blood. Mm, sounds expensive. <laughs> yeah, it's pretty incredible, though. The 
I really like how they how he did. I, I don't want to <laughs> hear him talking about some other, some other guy's book, but man, you really should look at that thing. I mean, he's got so many pictures in there, not just of the games, but all of this sort of paraphernalia and old advertisements and photos of the people and just just incredible. I mean, the guy really deserves maximum kudos for that project. It's just unreal. Yeah. Like, well, if it doesn't cost an arm and a leg. <laughs> I'm actually, actually kind of curious. I, I, yeah, I won't look it up right now. It's, it wouldn't surprise me if it's like 100 bucks. <laughs> yeah, probably not buying that anytime soon. There might be a soft cover edition, yeah. something like that. You know, that's one of the things Shane was uh, playing around with was, was the idea of uh, doing a Kickstarter for Dungeons and Desktops 2.0. Uh, the idea being to make so many copies it would be leather bound or hard hardcover or something. Mm -hmm. So, what do you what, think of? Do you think that's a good idea, or would that just be? Uh, I'm like, couldn't hurt, I guess. Like, I mean, what's the worst that could happen? <laughs> I guess the worst that can happen is nobody bids on it, right? I mean, nobody. Yeah, so you don't meet the campaign, and you look kind of, kind of stupid. Like honestly, Kickstarter. Like, wish our executive producer were here because he's the guy who knows Kickstarter stuff. I've backed a lot of role playing projects on Kickstarter, and they often do pretty well. Mm -hmm. I mean, if we tried to raise, uh, I don't know what, maybe a couple of grand, you might be able to. I don't. I don't think that would be too unrealistic, but. I don't have any idea how much it would cost to do, say, a leather-bound edition or a hardcover. It'd probably be more than people would want to pay, unless you're just a hardcore collector. It's probably the kind of thing you would uh, want to look into before you started a Kickstarter or an Indiegogo. Uh, like Indiegogo, it's like absentee, absentee <laughs> Kickstarter voting. <laughs> well, it's like, you know, Indiegogo might be a better way of going about it since. Um, Kickstarter is all or nothing. Indiegogo is, even if you don't meet your goal, you can still get money. Uh, I've but, never done a Kickstarter, despite my Kickstarter parody video, <laughs> which people apparently still think is real. It was a good parody, from what I remember. But it, it's hard to parody Kickstarter videos because some of them are so silly. <laughs> yeah, this is true. <laughs> I still remember Brian Fargo's um, uh, Wasteland 2. Oh, he was great at that. Yeah. Probably the way it worked out so well. Really sworn to Well, I mean, Kickstarter is so random, too. I mean, what's like the number one Kickstarter of all time is like the, the Pebble Watch, right? Uh, overall, yeah. I mean, what's so great about that? Well, now they've been bought out, and pebbles don't work anymore, so... <laughs> <laughs> well, it's... Um, I think it's because it was a uh, smartwatch in an age where smartwatches weren't really a thing. Mm -hmm. yeah. well, that's a good point. But I really think Chris Roberts and this whole Star Citizen thing has done a lot of damage. Oh, God. That thing might be released by time we all die. <laughs> I'm still kind of holding out hope. You know, Apparently, so right awesome. now, it's looking at 200 gig SSD to even play it. Like, it's absurd. Yes. What's the joke? By the time that game releases, we'll actually have the technology to, to, to go to space, <laughs> to go to other planets. By the time <laughs> the game releases, we'll have the technology to actually play the game. <laughs> You know, that wouldn't be too out of line with the origin strategy over the years. You know, they're <laughs> kind of infamous for what was it? Even back in the day, that you had to have those two mocking boards on your Apple II to get the full sound on one of those Ultimas. <laughs> I mean, who had that? Um, a lot of money. I wouldn't be surprised if Burger Becky did. <laughs> She's probably still got it. Yeah. <laughs> you know, somebody that's a huge Apple II. Nut is uh, John Romero. Mm. Mm. Don't think we ever spoke to him. No. It's well, you know, he he died after Doom. No, wait. Yeah, he's that's that's the one, right? Yeah, where he's where his his head is the final boss of Doom Two secretly. 
Yeah. He's a pretty cool guy, but he's yeah, he's super. Uh... Mm -hmm. I remember once meeting him one time at GDC, and you know you're just walking around with a guy, and he's trying to have a conversation with you, and every two seconds, there's somebody up there. Is, oh, hey, John, it's Ron Romero. Uh... <laughs> you can't can't have a conversation. Mm -hmm. uh, but if you ever get him by himself or <laughs> with a couple of his uh, cronies, uh, man, his his knowledge. And his memory is just vast. I mean, if, if you've got anything that anything you ever wanted to know about it or uh, the Apple II, uh, man, he's just got like this infinite recall, total recall memory. <laughs> I'm like, I think he's in Ireland now. I guess he's still married to uh, Brenda. Mm. Romero, right? What was her name before Brenda Brathwaite? Something like that. And she did one of the, uh, I think the last Wizardry game. Mm. She's pretty cool too. Yeah, I you guys talked to her, Brenda, Brenda Romero. Never talked to her, but I remember um, you talk, you know, your interview with her, talking about her. However long ago it was. Yeah, I guess that's probably been a while. I just remember that she was, uh, she was kind of uh, one of, she was kind of uh, into this, I guess, a feminist perspective on games before that was a thing. Mm -hmm. uh, she talked about these uh, game, like I guess I don't know if it was GDC. I never, I didn't really see this myself at GDC, but I guess some of these big gamer expos, uh, they were kind of notorious for the booth babes. Right. And so she was really, uh, she protested that. Yeah. E3 was really the bastion of that particular uh, thing back in the day. Uh -huh. Yeah. I've and then they said to. they wanted to cut back on it, and then E3 almost got canceled, but then they didn't cancel it, and then slowly it started happening again. Yeah, but booth babes aren't a thing anymore. Right. Uh, Different era. Yes. Well, yes, they are. Although it's kind of ironic that she, <laughs> that she did that because, of course, she did the uh, Playboy the Mansion game. I'm like, life uh, takes a lot of strange turns. <laughs> well, if you hear her talk about her work on that game, uh, you know, she... I forget exactly the way she put it, but apparently even with that game, she was trying to be a little bit more progressive than you would think. Uh, kind of a, <laughs> a subversive take on it. Maybe that's why it wasn't more popular. Perhaps. Like, perhaps the world was just not ready for Playboy, the video game. What is that? What's that one for the Sega uh, CD, The So Notorious? What, Night Trap? Yeah, Night Trap. Has there been a Kickstarter campaign for that? Bring that back yet? Yes. yes. I don't know if there's been a Kickstarter, but it's coming back. <laughs> yeah, oh but no, come back. It's come back. <laughs> no like, way. Yeah, didn't it come out? Had, yeah. Yeah, they had a 20 it's out? Yeah. I'm like, mm -hmm. man, no, not just Night that. Trap, but Double Switch. Getting that treatment. <laughs> I mean, Night Trap at least made sense. You like know what the beautiful game. irony of it is, though? It's rated teen. Yeah. Oh, it's even out for the Switch? No. Yeah. Way. Like, <laughs> the things you miss. <laughs> like, I need to. If only there was a podcast where a group of guys <laughs> covered game development news. Well, I mean. You don't have anything like that? We have something <laughs> like that, but, I mean, we don't cover, like, weekly news. <laughs> 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 if we covered yeah. weekly game development news, we wouldn't have interview section. Yeah, like, I mean, we might cover a rip from the headlines topic, but you no. Know. Like Crunk. No. I'm sick of covering Crunk. I can't, get it. I can't get to any of the news anymore because it keeps saying you've got an ad blocker. You've got an ad blocker. Yeah. I, I got like the thing disabled and uninstalled, and I still thinks I got the thing. Like, I don't have that problem in, you know, it's like, 
Also, I'm not turning off my ad blocker because, you know, I don't want my computer to be infected. Mm -hmm. Maybe if maybe if the ads weren't so infected with malware. <laughs> or in some sites, loud and boisterous. Yeah, it's loud and boisterous. You know, a lot of the times I'm sitting in a meeting, you know, I don't want this stupid video to start playing. Hey, are you 18 or older? <laughs> you know, that's that's the best <laughs> time for those ads. This is also why I have a Firefox script that disables autoplay. Mine, at, Chrome at least now mutes it by default, thank God. Mm. Mm. I mean, not just mutes, but it will stop. Yeah. So. Are you 18 or older? <laughs> no, you're going to jail. <laughs> <laughs> oh, jeez. Anyway, um, so what's the plan yeah, for so Mad Dungeon, Chat? Dungeons and Dust. Oh, uh, Mad Chat, yeah. Yeah, before we get back to Dungeons and Desktops. Yeah, I'm, I'm working on the next. I've been trying to play Bard's Tale 4. Uh, you know, I really don't. I hate doing reviews of games that haven't really. I, ideally, I would complete it before I did the review. I mean, you. I heard you guys talking before. I mean, you got the same the same issue, right? Just, just having yeah. enough time to adequately play a game so you yeah. feel like you're not just BSing the whole time. Yeah. Yeah, that's sort of where I'm at, but I'm pretty close to being confident enough to do the uh, yeah. Bard's Why Tale 4 review. Mind you, we don't worry about completing games. If we worried about that, jeez, reviews would be um, so much. Worse. Yeah, we could do that if we only got, like, a code a month. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, it's like we put in, like, at least two reviews a week. Well, say a game like Bard's Still 4, it's supposed to have something like, I don't know, maybe 40, 60 hours worth of gameplay. Mm -hmm. I mean, how many hours do you feel as a reviewer you should put into something like that? I'm like, well, it depends on the game. Like, um, when it comes to a RPG, uh, 40 to 60 hours is, I'd say, adequate. I mean, that's what we... I think that's about what we put in for Nino Kuni 2. It, yeah, it depends on the kind of game and on whether the game seems to be doing anything yeah. original as it progresses or if you feel like you got a pretty good idea how's it going. That's a good, that's a good point, yeah. It's also, you know, you gotta... We hold ourselves to our deadlines, um, usually. Mm -hmm. You know, maybe a, a bit of a delay, but, you know, usually we spend about a week on a game. That, that's usually adequate for most kinds of games. It's like, usually when extra time seated, it is one of these big... Um, like, um, I've got on my review queue Call of Cthulhu, the official game, which is going to take some time. From what yeah, I was looking at that on Steam. That looks pretty good. Yeah. Have you got I, a chance to play it yet? No, I haven't. That, like, I'm doing that during um, Thanksgiving, the Thanksgiving week break, because I've got other games to review. Like, right now I'm working on a game called Figment, which is a game like Bastion. You know, th these are the perils of reviewing. But... <laughs> And it yeah. sounded so attractive at first, didn't it? <laughs> mm -hmm. Well, at first, we there were weeks right. we didn't have reviews, so we had time to play games to completion. Yeah. yeah. Now it's like, huh, I, how long have I spent on this? Okay. When was I the last play? time I had a Sunday off? Let me ask you guys something. This okay. is something I've noticed. So if I review a game for Matt Chat, uh -huh. I hardly ever go back and finish it. I just don't even want to look at it again. You know, do, do you guys have that? It depends on the game. Yeah. Honestly, I mean, there. If I love the game. Yeah. It's just if something I, if I love the game, I usually try to go back and put some more time on it. But I have a hard time finding as much time as I want to even play them for review because I have a day job that takes up more of my time than I'd like. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Well, there's your problem. <laughs> I know. If only I could get arranged for that whole system where money just, like, rains down from the sky over my house every week. That might devalue, devalue the um, cost of money or whatever. Not if I don't tell anyone. <laughs> <laughs> but, yeah. I don't know I what mean, you're talking I don't know what the heck you're talking about. 
Yeah, like, uh, personally, no. I, I really don't go back and revisit games because um, the way our show works, it's... Yeah, Adam you know, definitely has no time. It's <laughs> like, I'm the one who handles mo the most reviews. Not all of the reviews, but, you know, the most. Because we get a lot of single-code games, and, I'll, and, well, being the conduit of codes, I get first dibs. Mm-hmm. You know, and then I'm usually second in line because I am the stream keeper. Yeah. And then Galix um, and Twilight. Like, Twilight's going to be doing his first review this week because um, he was available. And, you know, sometimes we get games that might uh, have problems on a, on a computer system. Like, uh, we've been, I've been having problems with Idea Factory games uh, past couple times, so he stepped up to handle one of the reviews this week. Yeah. yeah. Uh, it's like it is. Yeah, if, we, if we if we had the budget to get big game computers that could run all, run everything awesome, it would be much easier. But <laughs> well, it's like well, if we some, had the budget. Sometimes it's not even that. I mean, I, I noticed when I was doing this book, trying to get some screenshots, I was, I was even buying games off GOG and Steam that wouldn't run. <laughs> now, yeah. I've never had a problem with GOG stuff not just running effortlessly but yeah this time i there was a couple i just could not get to run at all well it's like with steam they a lot of times they don't update it they just throw the like basically the raw iso or whatever yeah and if your computer is it you know isn't compatible you're kind of screwed at least gog they try and at least patch them or rebuild them to work on a modern computer right I actually had to load up that uh, origin. <laughs> My apologies. Well, you know, I'll give them credit. I was trying to get Mass Effect 1 to run off the CDs, and this wasn't having any luck, and I finally went to origin, and they asked me for my CD key. And this game, this is like my original copy from back uh -huh. in the day. And I typed it in, it worked fine, installed, updated, patched, and ran great. I'm like, holy cow, I'm going to have to you know, give credit where it's due. Uh, that mm -hmm. at least that part worked great. Indeed. All right. Anyway, um, shifting back to dungeons and desktops, um, is there a price point set for this book yet? No, I don't think they've got a price point set. It's if, if it's anything like the, uh, I imagine it's going to probably cost about as much as this vintage games uh, two point book. Mm. I don't know which actually, how much is that one? <laughs> I had to look this up. Um, yeah, so they're selling the paperback of that for twenty three bucks. Yeah. So that wouldn't surprise me if this is. It might start off at uh, as much as sixty, but is it going to be available on, on various e-readers? Uh, yeah, there are, so. there are various e-readers. <laughs> I thought it was I just mean, Kindle. Not the, not, not the Nintendo e-reader. The uh, you know what I mean. Oh, like, that joke. Tablets or Kindles or things like that yeah this I don't one know looks what like they've only got the, anymore, uh, but. it's like the just the paperback version of vintage games 2.0 is available but i think they wait they take their sweet time <laughs> yeah but see dungeons uh -huh. and desktops 1.0 is on kindle right now don't get me wrong i prefer actual books but i know a lot of people find it easier to well look at this crap i mean so i'm looking here at my own book right so you get the paperback, thirty bucks. Mm -hmm. The Kindle version, forty bucks. That's weird. Shouldn't that be the other way around? You'd think so. Huh. Indeed. Furthermore, well, I... have you made any contracts for someone to make it a book on tape? <laughs> <laughs> uh, no, I don't think so. Are you a uh, narrator? Uh, not particularly. Or what do they call it? The audio. What do they call people to do that? Uh, Read narrator, more, reader, whatever. Voice, voice narrator. Of. Once again, that's more our executive producer's uh, line, since he actually narrated an audio book. Uh huh. Yeah, I'm sure it'd be harder than you'd right. think, getting the intonations right. I wouldn't know personally. A perfectly soporific voice. <laughs> I don't know. Your voice isn't bad. Well, thank Maybe you. It's not, it's, not, it's not like Leonard Nimoy's ghost or anything, but... I'm available for $4 a word. 
<laughs> Jesus. <laughs> I actually contacted the. You ever listen to uh, Dan Carlin's Hardcore History podcast? I've heard of it. I haven't. Again, it's a I've, fabulous podcast. But I mean, he's got this guy that comes on. That is, I guess you call him an announcer. It's like hardcore history. Blah blah blah. blah. <laughs> I thought, man, I love to. I love this guy's voice. You know, I'd like to get him on, like do a Matt chat. Welcome to, you know, here's Matt chat. You know, something like that. Just simple, a uh, little voiceover thing. And he wanted, I, I wanted to say he wanted $400 for basically five minutes worth of uh, voice work. Hmm. Well, it's it not, take, not it takes bad more, work if you can get it. Yeah, it, pr it probably takes more than one take and you want to, maybe go back and forth with you. I'm thinking about reasons. It's probably more than like five minutes of work, but yeah, uh, it's also, it's expensive and it's important to, you know, pay artists appropriately. Oh yeah. I mean, I totally get it. I mean, it's not just any voice. I mean, that's what he does for a living. Now, plus he said that he would be happy. He, he would work with me to come up with the script yeah, so you get that expertise and experience along with that, but <laughs> it's like I just had kind of sticker shock, you know. No doubt. But then again, um, you know, top price talent. Well, this is one of the issues we got into with Dungeons and Desktops because uh, you know Shane was very much of that opinion, right? Well, if somebody, if somebody does something for you, or you know, like the artist on the cover, uh, Chris Avalon's forward, I mean, all the all this stuff and. Usually the publishers don't pay them anything for that. And Shane kind of got upset. And he's, he was just saying, well, we should pay them something. <laughs> you know, because they are putting in all this work and exposure, quote unquote, isn't all that. It's basically exploitation. So right. kind of kind of his view. Uh, but neither one of them would uh, even hear of it. You know, they're just saying, I'm just doing this as a favor to you guys. So... Um I mean, I'm not going to push it, right? <laughs> but I mean, yeah, you know, in a perfect, ideally, yeah, they would have got, everybody would have gotten paid something. Right. Although if someone refuses payment, what, what do you do there? Um, I think I'd just send them some free copies of the book. And, you know, if the situation's ever reversed and they need me for something, of course, I won't hesitate. Well, Matt, you know, we could use a nice review of that Alpha Protocol. <laughs> It'll get reviewed. <laughs> Have you reviewed Alpha Protocol yet? No. <laughs> I played it a little bit, though. I didn't think it was... I mean, what's, what's the deal with that? I, I didn't play it enough to figure out what, what's supposedly so awful about it. I don't know. I have the game. It's just one of those things that's been sitting in my uh, backlog for years. From what I've heard, it's not as much as it's awful as much as it's just generic. Yeah. And things have basically done what it it has, but better. Yeah, it's basically uh, the poor man's Mass Effect, I've heard it. <laughs> the poor man's Mass Effect. <laughs> oh. I'm like, that's no offense to anyone at Obsidian. It's just, this is what I've heard through the through the years. You know, some of their ideas, like the Tyranny game, it was them, right? Mm-hmm. Yeah, just, I mean, it sounds pretty good, interesting, but it's just not really what people want. Like, yeah, we had them on the program for Tyranny, if I'm recalling correctly, like, a while ago. Yeah, Tyranny is an odd beast. Like, and... Yeah, I think that's one reason why it didn't really uh, connect. Because not not just because you're playing the villain, but, you know, tyr uh, Tyranny has all sorts of strange systems that yeah. you either love or hate. And, you know, it, it being a CRPG, it's a bit of a, you know, investment. So you're not going to enjoy it. Well, that's what I, I used to think that some of these games like that weren't successful because they were a little too different. Uh, but then, I mean, that's why I was kind of shocked that Pillars of Eternity 2 uh, was having some trouble because that seems to me to be pretty uh, straightforward, you know, fantasy role play. What? I couldn't, you yeah. like, I couldn't say what's going on right now. 
Like, if it's just, you know, people are getting disinterested in the genre again, or what? I mean, I hope not. Well, you remember but, that Siege of Dragonspear, and, mm. and that didn't turn out too well. I mean, uh, I couldn't say, but, um, like, Beam Dogs remaster seem to be doing well. Did I read somewhere where they're coming out with a new? Uh, is it Baldur's Gate? Baldur's Gate Three. There's a there's a rumor that Baldur's Gate Three is in development. But it's that, not going to be Beam Dog, and it's not going to be Obsidian, right? Maybe like I have no idea. Like, oh, a CRPG to watch, um, Disco Elysium. Or, uh, I think that's what they call what they're calling it now. Disco. Yeah. Um. It used to be no truce with the Furies. Oh, all right. groundbreaking blend of hard-boiled cop show and isometric RPG. Urban fantasy setting. Yeah, it's been on my radar for a while. I've been hearing from these uh, this Adam A T not Adam but <laughs> Atom A T A T O M R P G. Have you seen that one? Mm, sounds it's kind of a, it's kind of a Fallout like game. <clears throat> yeah, I think I've heard of that. I, anyway, um, as, this uh, one actually looks really nice. I'm glad you brought that to my attention. Yeah, I, I tried to get uh, the developers on the program. They're kind of busy, you know, developing the game. So, so. the freshest and most fascinating RPG I've experienced in years. PC gamer. <laughs> uh, I've heard good things about it. Available to be announced. So, was this a Kickstarter project? I, I want to say so, but I'm not. You know, it's like, um, I'm not sure offhand uh, you know, it looks a little bit like that Torment Ties of Numenera game mm. uh, there's another one that just kind of disappeared like th there was a lot of hype behind uh, Tides of Numenera and then it, it kind of got released and you know that's uh, a weird game man some disturbing <laughs> stuff in there <laughs> did you play that one no. Oh, man, yeah, that's some creepy stuff. I still think the best, uh, to me, the best CRPG in recent times has got to be this Divinity Original Sin mm. uh, 1 and 2, especially the second one. Yeah. Getting, Those are great, great, great games. Yeah. Once again, games I have not gotten to. If you like the old-school turn-based combat, that's about the best you're going to get, I think. Yes, I've heard. Uh, anyway, um, so as enlightening as all this is, we do have to move to the next segment. Uh, and you are welcome to join us if you want to talk about Alone in the Dark. But uh, the book is Dungeons and Desktops 2.0. Um, it's currently in its final stages of development. Uh Release date seems to be spring 2019, um, and a price point about 20 to 30 dollars. Um, we'll be talking more about that you know, when it comes uh, when it nears release. So, Petty Fan, play us to the next segment. All right, welcome to the topic of discussion. Um, obviously, since we were planning on having this episode originally on Halloween, we picked a Halloween-appropriate topic. Um, it's a couple days after, you know, who's the count? Um, so we're talking about Alone in the Dark um, this week. Uh, for those who might not know what this game series is, uh, it's a hugely important step in the evolution of the development of the survival horror genre. Uh, mm -hmm. it, indeed, it's probably the codifier of what survival horror is. 
uh, especially yep. um, really going forward. Um, now, survival horror as a concept does predate Alone in the Dark, believed to be invented by the game Sweet Home on the NES, which mm -hmm. was a Capcom RPG, and which also gave significant influence to Resident Evil, considered to be basically the doom of survival horror. And if, you, if Resident Evil is doom, then Alone in the Dark is Wolfenstein 3D. Because, <laughs> yeah, because um, while Sweet Home provided a lot of not just influence but talent to Resident Evil, the actual, like, design of the games, um, Resident Evil games, comes from Alone in the Dark. Because Alone in the Dark is the first 3D uh, survival horror game. That's where all the camera angles and the tank controls come from. <laughs> yep. And the clumsy use of weapons, too. <laughs> yeah. I mean, also, that was probably the easiest way to, like, program stuff, but... Probably. Like, but, you know, it, it eventually became part of the genre. Uh-huh. You know, it's also, mm -hmm. um, you know a lot of what they were doing back in the day was pre-rendered uh, backgrounds versus, you know, polygonal backdrops. So, you know, you have also movies. <laughs> Always with the movies, with video games. Uh, like, <laughs> seriously, it's been the thing for decades. Like, video games trying to be movies. And um, the strange... Uh, angles of Alone in the Dark eight uh, cinematic movie angles. The Dutch angle. Yeah. Yep. Yeah, you know, that kind of thing. So, uh, who here has actually played the original Alone in the Dark game? I played it during this week. <laughs> Got it for, um, from the Halloween sale. Yeah. I'm like, not me. I'm not much for horror games in general. Same. I like the trappings. I like the trappings of horror, but not things that try to actually scare me. Okay. <laughs> uh, I'll, how do I put this? Um, Alone in the Dark probably isn't going to scare you these days. No. <laughs> I, like, oh, no. I, I know it's probably like cheesy as crap, but like, try. <laughs> You know, it, yeah, I like, still don't necessarily enjoy it, even if it's not actually scary. I, I get that. I'm just saying, like, a look, like maybe people talk about games aging. Um, Alone in the Dark is a really good example because, mm -hmm. like, uh, keep in mind, Alone in the Dark was completely serious. Um, you know, uh, completely intended to be taken seriously. It's just if you mm -hmm. look at the graphics. Not even today, but, you know, anytime within, I'd say, the 21st century, um, you'd probably laugh. It, it's so cartoony. Like, so cartoony. <laughs> yeah. You know, it, it, it's like the creature designs are very, um, yeah, it, you know. Those things that jump through the windows after those brat things are especially silly. <laughs> yeah, it, it's like they look ridiculous. It's not just because they're low poly. You know, it's like you go back to uh, Resident Evil. I mean, those things look, lo you know, they're not scary because they're low poly, but you can still see the intent there. You know, mm -hmm. it's more Alone in the Dark's art direction was kind of weird. I mean, a good jump scare is going to scare you. Yeah. Even with low res, I mean, yeah, yeah, especially if it has a scary sound effect. Exactly. <laughs> yeah, it's just uh, the the creatures are too, they look too goofy. I, I always yeah. thought that, like, even back in the day when I first played this, <laughs> sometime back in the mid '90s, like. Yeah, Alone in the Dark came out in 1992. Yeah. 
I mean, and I don't want to interrupt you. No, go ahead. <clears throat> but I mean, one of the things I think is so brilliant about the, of the about this game and and Frederick, what's his name? Reynal, Renal. Never uh, quite sure how to pronounce his name. But anyway, if you think about when this game came out, and the primitive state of the 3D animation, and the hardware acceleration, I mean, it, it was such a brilliant move uh, to do a zombie horror game, uh, because that way you don't have to show fast animation, smooth right. animation. I mean, zombies kind of like, you know, <laughs> kind of this herky jerky movement anyway, right? Mm -hmm. So I mean, it's the perfect monster to have in a. A 3D game. If they tried to do werewolves or vampires, it just wouldn't have worked, right? Uh, so I give them kudos for that. Mm -hmm. And I think uh, these are supposed to be, um, how do I put this, actual zombies. That is to say, this game takes place in New Orleans, so we're dealing with um, fucking voodoo zombies. Voodoo zombies, yeah, the original. Mm. Yeah. yeah, the, the right, thing that is actually zombies. what zombies came from. Yeah. It, yeah. You know, it's like zombies before they became just kind of a catch-all for um, reanimated corpses um, have a very distinct tradition in the voodoo religion. So in the in this game, the, zomb the zombies aren't actually undead. Uh, I think they're slit. Yeah, they're. they're um, voodoo, zo voodoo zombies are people who are basically like severely brainwashed to yeah. the point where their bodies don't work quite right. Hypnotized, yeah. basically. Yeah, I mean there were other creatures like the, the those. Um, I'm not exactly sure what they were. Bipedal rats. Like, yeah, the things that jump out, jump out the windows. <laughs> yeah, and there's and, also the weird things guarding the stairs as well. And um, the, in the first Alone in the Dark game, so you have the choice of a male and female protagonist. Um, the weird thing is, even though Edward Carnby becomes the <coughs> um, face of the franchise, it's not his story necessarily. It's more, it's actually Emily Hartwood's story because, well, mm -hmm. she is the, um, I'm trying to remember the relation, like granddaughter. A niece. There we go. Niece of the um, person who deceased. <laughs> Descarto Hartwood. Um, and Alone in the Dark has some good ideas. It has some bad ideas. <coughs> and the bad ideas are the end game. I, if you got back... Okay, so... An amazing. Um, platforming. Oh, that's right. oh yeah. yeah. It, it's like, so, <laughs> for whatever reason, the original Alone in the Dark game <coughs> um, decided to have its end game with jumping. You know, platform jumping. jumping. And it's bad. Like, if you, like, if you want to imagine what tank control you know, tank controls with platforming. Uh, oh, God. Yeah. No, just no. no. <laughs> oh, yeah, have you seen his Alpha Waves game? <laughs> yeah. That I'll, He must have been thinking that, right? <laughs> I, I'd imagine so. Uh, for those who don't know, Alpha Waves, that is the first 3D platformer. Also by Infogrames. Yeah, it's right now. I think came up with that. Mm-hmm. Did you ever interview him? No, but I would love to. He's, I guess he's French. Mm. I think he yeah. surely speaks English, though, right? It's possible. I mean, this yeah, game I'd love was... to have him on. He's one of the people I've... Have you Have you had him on? Fragments? Yeah. Like, I have not come across him. Like, at least not yet. I, I don't know what he's doing these days. Is he, like, even in the industry still? Hmm. Yeah. I don't know. I'm kind of nervous about people that have all those little marks above their, their name, like Frederick. Like, there's a little <laughs> dot above the E's. Right. <laughs> what is that? <laughs> that almost know. never happens. Frederick. 
Because see, see, in in most European languages, when there are two dots above an A, an O, or a U, it means that it used to be followed by an E. Looks like his last project was 2014, some kind of... Uh... Actually, I'm looking at his Wikipedia page. Um, he did a game in 2017 called Too Dark. Too Dark? Yeah. Too dark. Hmm. Too Dark. Yeah. Is that just a black screen? Possibly. <laughs> nice. A stealth adventure horror game. <laughs> oh. Yeah. Well, things you oh, learn. Oh, I remember seeing that game on Steam now. Well, I had no idea this was the, the great Frederick Friedrich uh, Renault. <laughs> I think I have it on my wish list, actually. <laughs> yeah. We are Dark, disturbing, and dirty. 3D. Oh, f oh, Frederick. Yeah, it's it's a weird French name. Yeah. Frederick. Alex is our linguist. <laughs> <laughs> you need you something to get him Although on that. that is a weird name for in French, I think. So, like, even in French, they'd say that's weird. Anyway, like one of my French what I, what, what, two dark game. Uh. <laughs> anyway, getting back on the Alone in the Dark train. Um, yeah, so Alone in the Dark hit in 1992. Wasn't a smash hit phenomenon, but did pretty well. Like, mm -hmm. it was on the 3DO too, right? <clears throat> yes. Um, that was done by Interplay, if I'm recalling correctly. But 3DO? Yeah, yeah uh, Alone in the Dark 1 and 2. Is it by um, Interplay or iMotion? Yeah, you're right. Interplay. You're right. <laughs> yeah, my memory served me well. Yeah, anyway, and it was successful enough to get a sequel. Um which followed about a year afterwards, uh, though kind of changed things up pretty significantly. Uh, as it... It's been a... Like, I think... Like, I'm trying to remember. Uh, yeah. Um, like, it has no connection to the first game thematically outside of, you know, Edward Carnby is your um, protagonist once more. And this is much, you know, this is much more dealing with, like, voodoo and um... Mm -hmm. Dang. Is this still that same format? <laughs> yeah, still the it, same kind it, of 3D format, or is this a, yeah, just a straight-up platformer? Um, no, no. Uh, the, I think they got rid of the 3D platforming elements it's just yeah i didn't play all that much of alone in the dark 2 and i never played alone in the dark 3 <coughs> but it looks like it all didn't have anything to do with part two yeah um no the director for this one was frank d um giro giro lame uh however you pronounce that <laughs> giro lame i guess yeah. It hey, is unpronounceable. Well, it's like, here, Galax, how do you pronounce this? You're our, uh, you're our linguist. Uh, where am I looking? How do you pronounce Yeah, de Girolami. De Girolami, or something like that. Yeah, that's convincing. Like I said, he studied linguists, uh, linguistics in uh, college. If anyone knows how to pronounce the shit, he does. <laughs> but yeah, the first three Alone in the Dark games did follow the same uh, engine format. I, um, that would change with Alone in the Dark, The New Nightmare. A.K.A. probably the other Alone in the Dark game you played, if not the, the original or yeah. the uh, 2008 edition. Um, yeah. And yeah, I did play Alone in the Dark, The New Nightmare. And 
It's a lot more Resident Evil-y. It is. Incarnations. Like, you can just see the um, circle of influence um, rounding about in the new nightmare. Yes. No, it's in the art direction. It's in the, like, new creatures. Um, yep. All that. Um, and would you consider that an improvement? Yes, actually, I would. <laughs> uh, no, it's like it. It, it like controls the student teaching the master. Yeah, it controls about as well as any Resident Evil game does. Mm -hmm. huh. How well you think that controls is kind of up to you. <laughs> this kind of interesting little tidbit from Wikipedia. So it says the editors of Computers Games Magazine nominated The New Nightmare as the best adventure game of 2001, but ultimately gave the award to, drumroll, Mist 3 Exile. I'm, like, like, um, um, The New Nightmare is not an adventure game. It's not. <laughs> it's a survival horror. <laughs> what do they know over there, Computer Games Magazine? It's like, I don't know. Why would you even compare Alone in the Dark to New Nightmare and Mist 3 Exile? Mm -hmm. See, <laughs> they both involve going around and finding places that can, and they can be kind of dangerous. There are puzzles. That's all I got. I got Yeah, there, there are puzzles. <laughs> there are puzzles. And I think on balance, Alone in the Dark, the New Nightmare is the best of the uh, series. Like you know, it does, mm -hmm. at least that what I played. Like I said, two and three are bit, are kind of out of my mind zone. But you know, just not having shitty early 3D jumping alone. <laughs> yeah, I just have bad. Like, if there's anything that traumatized me from the first Alone in the Dark, was the jumping. <clears throat> <laughs> you think you think I'm kidding? I'm like, try playing that. At least you also didn't have to go in and out of a menu just to interact with objects. <laughs> yeah. Anyway, so I suppose we should also talk about the 2008 uh, Alone in the Dark, which is um, not a mm. remake, but um, kind of the new fourth installment. Anyway, Twilight, you wanted to rant on this, so have at it. Okay, um, yeah, first of all, was the Wii the first intro in version of this game? Oh, I get that feeling it was, if it came first and they ported it to PC. Because, good lord, just, just trying to get the controls and trying to interact with everything, it... Just trying to move a table, and it, it, the, your character not even picking up on anything. You have to move around, and it's it's the mess. <laughs> <laughs> That's all I can really say about it. It's like your one. Stick is controlling one thing, and the other stick is controlling something else. I, I don't. I thought I had a lot more to really say on this, but that's all I've to say. Is that I just hated the control scheme and how finicky everything was. Better to be uh, alone in the dark than to be playing this game. <laughs> well, I say so. Like, yeah. and yet this it was. Felt... Yeah, <laughs> it's like. Yet this wasn't the worst that the Lone in the Dark would produce. Because, well, we've got the last game in the series. And yet, th this is the thing that got released. Alone in the Dark Illumination. <laughs> oh, no. I'm like... Oh, I, the I title even... alone has me cringing. <laughs> Just think about that title. How do you... Like, how did Someone you... got paid for that. Yeah, it's yes. like... Yes. The, the, because... Those are literally the light the is on. Yeah, th these are literally the opposite concepts. <coughs> yeah. 
And so what this thing is, it's a four, it's an online um, cooperative survival horror uh, game. Like, it's, you it's can start to see death. the flaws in the concepts <laughs> alone. Mm hmm. <clears throat> Let's and see. Alone? Alone, alone in the dark so with friends in a flashlight. The dark? <laughs> not so much. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> just, just <laughs> like, like, I'm still stunned. This so is basically, this is with friends in the light. Yeah. <laughs> basically. Yeah, lot. yeah, I know in the other games, you, at least, well, at least in New Nightmare, you interacted with some other characters, but you spend most of your time alone. In the dark. Yes. Yeah. I mean, I, I guess that's kind of the other thing about the early Alone in the Dark games. They, they really couldn't get the dark part. Illumination. <laughs> I can't believe this. <laughs> Just, to, yeah, the, this game is... Uh, it Who did it? Atari did this? Jason Bryce. Yeah, Atari. Jeffrey Bryce. Apparently his brother, I guess, is the composer. Yeah, I'm like yeah, it's, Atari did this. I'm like, but they can't do this anymore because um, as of last month, two months ago, the franchise was sold to THQ Nordic. The mm -hmm. IP vacuum. That yeah. sounds like an Alan Wake ripoff. <laughs> it, it very well could have been. Like it might have been considering how actually it was <laughs> it's like it, it very well could have it could have been the intent like j just among every other thing like like the the products that post bankruptcy atari have produced um not good like almost like there was a reason for the bankruptcy yeah. <laughs> the official youtube channel Suggested that the original name for the game was Alone in the Dark Online. That would have been better. Mm -hmm. Like I'm I'm alone in the dark online right now. <laughs> <laughs> that still would have been better than Illumination. But <laughs> Illumination. <laughs> well, this is this is classic. This has got to be one of the worst titles. I'm not disagreeing. I'm like. I can't think of a game with a worse title right now. <laughs> Me neither. <laughs> oh, this is worth it. I mean, it's, it's almost like if you sat down and like, guys, I want to do it alone in the dark. What is the worst subtitle we can come up with for this? <laughs> well, yeah, illumination. <clears throat> oh, please tell me this. Oh, I got a, <laughs> I got a eighteen percent score. Oh, yeah. Th oh, this got savage. Really. Oh. <laughs> Universally <laughs> negative <Art>. reviews. <laughs> yeah. Uh, I don't even think you can play it anymore now. I think the servers have been shut down. Uh, this is, uh, I kind of want to play it now. Just think, <laughs> could it be that? Oh, the website's dead. <laughs> hey, well, yeah. It, like, you can it's... still get it on Steam. So, mm -hmm. you know, if you want to waste your money. If you want to be alone in the dark, just be like, hey, guys, let's let's play alone in the dark illumination tonight. Come on, everybody's invited. Uh, you got the worst video game of 2015? Oh, come on. Can it be that bad? <laughs> it can't be that bad. You want to have, you, have you played this? No. I'm like, I'm not... Uh, I don't hate myself. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Like, look, I, I, I can't trust a product with a name that bad. <laughs> just, just on principle. It, it could be the greatest game ever, and I still wouldn't play it, just because, wow, you have so fundamentally misunderstand, misunderstood your own concept. It looks kind of like a Resident Evil game. <laughs> when, when Wouldn't be that, shocked if that was um, yeah. influenced. Yeah, yeah, it wouldn't be the first time that uh, Alone in the Dark yep. took inspiration from its progenitors. No. Yep. It's just, uh, as I was saying, um, yeah, so 
Atari sold off Alone in the Dark to THQ Nordic a few months ago. And, you know, what their plans are for the franchise, who knows? I'm like, they, they just got it. You know, THQ Nordic just got a whole bunch of stuff that they haven't announced plans for. Or are still working out the um, legal issues, like Kingdoms of Amalur, um, they bought. But, oh, no. uh, you know, they own the IP now, but they're still sorting out uh, publishing rights to uh, Reckoning. Because EA still owns those. Oh. Corporate legal issues. Like. Mm -hmm. That was fun. Yes. Anyway, so that'll about do it for Alone in the Dark. And indeed, for this installment. <laughs> yeah. Indeed, this installment of uh, Fragments of Silicon. Um, so coming up on Sunday, we will be having reviews of. Figment, um, Hyper Nept Hyper Dimension Neptunia. We're not exactly sure how to. We've been going back and forth on this title. Um, um, well, first of all, it's Mega Dimension Neptunia. Sorry, sorry. There are so many of these now. Yes. Yeah, I don't blame yeah. you. <laughs> yeah. the, the, actually, the thing that bothers me is that they're considering Mega to be an upgrade to Hyper. To me, Hyper is beyond Mega. Yeah, I might have... Uh, yeah, it's Hyper Dimension Neptunia. Um, it's seven. Mega Dimension Neptunia 7 Illumination. <laughs> well, no, it's, it's... Okay, see, you say that that would be fine, but see, the thing is that it's... The, the number is written V-I-I-R. Yeah. Which could be V2R, yeah. it could be 7R, it could be 7VR, because it's a it's a it's a VR update of seven, or a VR enabled update of seven. Yeah, so and we literally don't know how to say this game's full title. <laughs> yeah, mm -hmm. and Acid Nimbus. So until Sunday, I, I, I R. Yeah. So until Sunday, I wish you good gaming.